All right, welcome back to another episode of the Cody Tucker Show. As always, I'm your host, Cody Tucker. Be sure to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, had a little bit to talk about here today. Um, so, looks like it's about to start snowing in the next couple hours. And boy, am I excited. Oh my God. This is... <laughs> I mean, I am definitely in the wrong state for like the type of weather that I enjoy, which is freezing cold. Like I am basically a human polar bear and I unfortunately live in a state where 90% of the year is just ungodly hot. And then there's about a two week period every year where the cold comes in and just smacks you right in the nuts. And boy, am I excited. <laughs> like, I'm looking out my window right now, and if I start seeing some snowflakes, uh, screw this thing. <laughs> I am running outside and pissing in the snow. It is, I mean, there's a reason why it's like a trope in TV and movies. Pissing your name in the snow is one of the greatest joys that a human being can have. Like, there is nothing better than going out in the snow, dropping trowel, and, I mean, luckily there's only four letters in my name, because the <laughs> the shrivel effect <laughs> starts to uh, take hold real quick, and I'm usually about halfway through, uh, I'm usually like towards the end of the uh, cursive D, before my old John Thomas starts shriveling to the point to where I'm basically just soaking my own nuts. Uh, and, well, that's not good for anyone. But sometimes I'll, you know, I'll make it all the way through the Y, which is pretty good feeling. Um, and, you know, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. There is really no better feeling than, you know, having your meat out and just watching like a little snowflake gently come down and just, you know, ever so softly kiss the tip of your penis. Boy, it is a, a feeling like no other. Um, it's really, it's what Christmas is all about. Um, uh, yeah. Put that in a fucking Christmas card. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. So if I, you know, just jump up and leave, you know, don't worry. I'm not having a heart attack. Despite what most people may imagine. Um, I am just going to go out and, you know, try to see if I can't, uh, put the old signature in the snow. So anyways, so there's that. That's going on. Um, and it really, it'll make up for uh, the horrible mood that I'm in right now. Because to be on, so to be honest, um, I am, I'm a massive NFL fan, massive football fan. And I don't talk about sports a whole lot on here. Cause again, there's a million sports podcasts and I'm not a sports expert. I'm not really an expert on anything yet. <laughs> Here we are. Um, but I I love football, hockey, and basketball. Baseball can completely suck one. Um, there's just there's no chance on earth that you will get me to care about a sport that has 160 games. Because that means none of the games matter. Hockey and basketball are kind of toeing the line, to be quite honest, which is one of the reasons why I don't start watching uh, hockey or basketball until right about now. Um, the NFL does it perfectly. 17 games. Every game matters. Uh, now, granted, I am also a um, Las Vegas Raiders fan, which, you know, that's that's a... That's a topic for another day, I guess, because I'm going to end up driving myself to having a fucking aneurysm if I keep talking about the Raiders. So, but uh, playoffs have started, and I'm recording this, um, well, I guess it'll be the day before the episode, two days before the episode comes out. It's Sunday right now. 
um, right before the rest of the playoff games have happened. So as of right now, there have been two playoff games. And I have lost my ass in both of them. <laughs> Boy, I thought the Browns were going to win. That didn't happen. Um, and I thought somehow the Dolphins might at least cover the old spread. And uh, they did not. Which I should have fucking known better. I should have known better. I mean, it was with a windshield minus 30 degrees in that damn Chiefs game. There isn't. You, I mean, I love the cold, as aforementioned. There is no force on this planet that get, could get me to sit in a stadium in minus 30 degree wind chill weather. No way. Um, I mean, the Beatles could have a reunion concert. <laughs> and no, nah, I'll, uh, I'll watch it on YouTube. Like, there is... I mean, it, God, it has to be miserable. Which, you know, not to brag, but I did play a, a little bit of JV football back in the day. <laughs> and I remember us having, like, practice, and it was, like, snowing a little bit during our practice. And how much it hurt to do anything. Like, I can't imagine. Oh, my. I mean, granted, they're getting paid millions of dollars. And if somebody was going to give me a million dollars, I'd go out there, you know, completely in the buff. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I mean there's, a, you know, you can't really complain about it too much when you're getting paid millions of dollars. Um, but all uh, case, the point of any of this is really that as much as I love football, and love the NFL. I am getting about this close from never watching another game. The amount of times during that game where I was like, okay, this is rigged. This whole thing is a, a sham. And I know that, like, the NBA had issues with this, you know, with old Donahue, 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 I think is the name, the ref that was, you know, the ref that was leading the league in blocks. <laughs> like it, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to think that the NFL is rigged. I don't want to think any sports are rigged. But when you're watching a game, and I already hate the Kansas City Chiefs so much. And this is pre-Swift. This is pre, uh, you know, the reign of, Taylor Swift. I already hated the Chiefs as a Raiders fan. Hate them so much. Um, as someone from the same area as Patrick Mahomes, where all you hear is people talking about how much they love Patrick Mahomes and now are also somehow Kansas City Chiefs fans, makes it even worse. But when you watch a game and you notice that all the calls seem to be going... <laughs> <laughs> towards a certain team to protect a certain player, it is hard not to just say, okay, I'm done with this. Like, if the Chiefs win the Super Bowl this year, mark my words, uh, it is January 14th. If the Chiefs win the Super Bowl this year, I, I'm done. I'm boycotting the league. I'm, <laughs> I'm turning into you know a 70-year-old a white person when they saw Kaepernick taking a knee. That is the feeling I'm having right now, seeing the uh, just blatant cheating going on by the NFL referees towards the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, in you know helping the Kansas City Chiefs, I guess towards all the other teams. But um, yeah, I will. I will. Boy, I'm boycotting the goddamn NFL. They're already screwing up the Super Bowl halftime shows, and they've been doing that for a long time. Uh, you know. So that already has made it be like, God dang, like, even the Super Bowl is not really that fun to watch anymore. Now, I mean, I'm really, I think, just talking out of my ass right now. Because even if the Chiefs do win the Super Bowl, there's like a 99% chance that when, as soon as the ne next year season starts, I'm right there watching it heartbroken every week 
<laughs> but we'll see. I mean, it's just, and then of course, like the Taylor Swift coverage just makes it so much worse. Like there really isn't no one more mediocre in every way a person could be mediocre than Taylor Swift. Like, and I know I've gone on and on about how much I hate that human being. But whenever the, like, there just isn't a person more boring. <laughs> like, it is, it is just astounding. I mean, I guess whenever your parents are fucking millionaires and can buy your way into being famous, you know, then, well, it might work out for you. But it is just staggering to me. Like Travis Kelsey, handsome dude. And again, hate the Chiefs. Cannot stress this enough. (laughs) Travis Kelsey, handsome dude, had a dating show where every woman on the show was a, oh my God, like, you know, a solid 10 and to like settle on Taylor. I mean, Jesus, like there are women that work at, you know, the, there are women at the TGI Fridays that are 10 times more attractive than Taylor Swift and probably better singers. (laughs) Uh, You know, I mean, you can go to a karaoke night at a biker bar and see, you know, women who are better looking and more talented singing, you know, fucking Bonnie Raitt songs at the top of their fucking lungs. Anyways, it's just, you know, something I just wanted to get off my tits and well, there it is. Just really a a frustrating NFL season. I mean, it's not over, but it feels over. So yeah, winter is coming. Anyways, we'll move on from that. I believe I actually had a few um, questions sent in that I'd like to go through. I think there was a couple. Yeah, here we go. So, we'll do a little uh, answering the old... uh, I mean, God, to say fan questions just sounds really... So, we won't say... We'll just say people who somehow... Listen to this. <laughs> Who have sent in questions that they would like me to answer. Got a couple here. Uh, first one. So some of these are sent in and some of these are just, you know, these are just good questions. Questions that have come to me. I don't know whether they're like, they really care about hearing my take on this. They're questions that I've come across. They're good questions. So, probably didn't need the entire explanation for that, but you got it. First one. What is the weirdest conspiracy theory that you believe in? (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) Now, let me tell you. I mean, this is what we're about 13 minutes in. This could go for another six hours. Um, I fancy myself to be a bit of a a realist. I like to think I'm a pretty logical person. Um, I don't believe in, you know, really any organized religion or spirituality. People who say that they're spiritual, oh boy, that's a, boy, that's a, an annoying group of people. Really is. See, like, I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual. Okay. You're not unique. You aren't. (laughs) I'm not unique. You're not unique. Thinking that, oh, I don't subscribe to any religion, but I am still spiritual. I believe in some sort of higher power. Okay. Based on what? Why would you believe that there's a higher power if you don't believe in a certain religion? Because the only reason that the idea of a higher power exists is the formation of a theology. A religion. It doesn't necessarily have to be Christianity, uh, Islam, Hinduism, whatever. But the religions have existed pretty much since civilization has existed. So if you want to believe in higher power, go ahead. You know, that's cool. But it's connected to some religion. So you just are trying to 
make it seem like you're unique by saying that you don't believe in any sort of religion, yet you're still spiritual. The only way that it really makes sense is you either are, are religious or you're not. And if you're not religious, then you don't need to be believing in any of this other stuff. Uh, that is where I tend to lie. Now, that being said, it makes the idea of, the idea of dying way more terrifying. <laughs> Which is probably why it is my number one fear next to grasshoppers. Um, because... The idea of nothing happening is so terrifying to me. And I know for some people, it's like good for them. Like the idea that this is it, this is your one shot, um, it, make the most of it. Man, if that that make, gives you comfort, boy, that is that is amazing. It does not do that for me at all. <laughs> it makes me terrified that I won't know what happens after I'm gone. Um, whereas if I did just, you know, say, screw it. I'm a, I'm a Baptist now, which actually, if I was going to pick anything, I'd probably go full on Roman Catholic. Um, seems like a wild, uh, a bit of a wild time. So, and it's like easily the most terrifying religion there is. And as somebody who loves tradition and loves like, weird, creepy, ritualistic stuff. Really nothing, you know, scratches those itches like a uh, a good mass. So, you know, gun to the head, I'm converting to Catholicism. Uh, you know, so there's that. But also, that's probably never going to happen. It might, but probably won't ever. But I do understand the, like, like the people who say, like, I'm not worried about dying because I know I'm going to a better place. I don't understand how you believe that. I'm not criticizing for believing. It. I'm saying literally, I don't, like, I can't picture that in my head and it just, like, be okay. <laughs> like, okay, like, I 100% believe that that's going to happen. And I'm not saying that the people who do believe that also don't think that, you know, I'm not saying that the people who believe it aren't skeptical. Like, I'm sure that there are people who 100% believe that that is the truth. And I am uh, so jealous of those people. <laughs> I just can't do it. I am just inherently, I don't trust people. I don't trust people. I don't trust ideas. I don't trust things. When I'm told that I should believe something, immediately, red flag, I don't believe you. Now, that whole train of thought, I probably, that meant nothing. Back to the point, <laughs> and I guess it is kind of connected. I love conspiracy theories. Love them. I love learning about wacky conspiracy theories. And I would say nine out of ten of them, I completely dismiss as just being like, oh, this is fun. But it ain't real. The moon landing, it wasn't faked. Now, was the footage, some of the footage faked? Oh, yeah. But we went to the moon. And the people were like, well, why didn't we go back? We did go back. Multiple times. There have been a lot of people who have walked on the moon. <laughs> it isn't just old Neil and Buzz. I think, eh, could be wrong. I think there's been like 17 people that have walked on the moon. Which is crazy that you only can, that we only know two of them. Like, if that number's right, which I think it is, that's like 15 people that walked on the moon. I mean, I can name more people who, you know, I can name more people who were on The Sopranos. And now that's, I mean, I can name more people who were on, I can name more people who did guest spots on Full House than I can people who walked on the moon. <laughs> that isn't good. That can't be good for society. And I'm sure I'm not alone. Um, yeah. Like, that is astounding. But anyways, I do believe that the moon landing was real. We did it multiple times. And then, like, why haven't we been back since then? For what? There's nothing there. 
Why, why would we spend millions of dollars to go back to just a hunk of dust? Because if you watch the videos, it doesn't seem like a uh, pleasant place. It's not like there's like, you know, a mall and like, a, you know, a, an amusement park or something. Like there's nothing to do. <laughs> like all the cool shit is here. Like why would you spend millions of dollars to go to there? Like you can spend a couple grand and spend a week at Disney World. Like yeah. Yeah, I'd much rather do that than go on some barren wasteland. Well, anyways. Um, so that one, and of course the Kennedy assassination, is my holy grail. Actually, the holy grail is kind of a conspiracy theory. Ever since I remember reading the Da Vinci Code, like right whenever the movie came out. So like I read the book, immediately watched the movie right afterwards. Because it was like, I guess when I was in like... I mean, middle school, and boy, did I start, <laughs> I became very convinced in the Priory of Sion, and that, <laughs> and that there was a living, and that the Holy Grail was not a cup, but a person, and uh, yeah, that, that one got me full on, and still does, I still 100% believe that Jesus had kids, if Jesus was real, holy fuck, I don't want to go into that, okay, so, focus so a conspiracy that i believe that is probably the most like obscure conspiracy because obviously there are very obscure conspiracies now there's the whole epstein thing oh boy um there's the uh there's like weird conspiracies involving glitter uh and it's use or it's possible use in the development of uh uh Weapons for the U.S. government. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, but the one that I am... I 100% believe in... From like... You know, and I know anecdotal evidence is not real evidence. But for me... I guess I'll, I'll use it. Is the th conspiracy that... Oil companies pay off local you know, municipal, local governments to make red lights last longer so that people have to buy more gas. I know that that sounds... Now, some of my... One of my uncles has a bit of a different take on that. He says that he believes that that is true, but it's not the oil companies. It's, in his words, the Jews. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> I I don't think that's necessarily true. <laughs> I don't think there's just I don't think there's just a group of Jewish people who say you know make red lights uh, last longer, hit a little uh, you know lever, and then suddenly red lights last longer. Not buying that so so much. That you know he can have that one. I wholeheartedly believe that oil companies. Whether Exxon Valdez, whatever Exxon, uh, Exxon Mobil, Exxon Valdez, what's the Exxon Valdez? Oh, that's the that's the fucking oil spill. Exxon Mobil, whatever. All the other oil companies, BP, even I'm sure it happens in, you know, Britain. I 100 percent believe that they make red lights last longer, because I don't know how many times I've been driving around, like especially at night. Stop at a red light. There is not a single car within a, I would say, half mile radius of me. And I will be at a red light for 15 to 20 minutes. And eventually, I'll usually just run the red light. Sorry. But, you know, the fucking cabal is not, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not losing my money over this shit. And then, but while I'm waiting, I'm like, why is this happening? Because on the other side of the road, the other crossway, green light the whole time. There's no cars coming in uh, north or south. Like if I'm going east-west, north-south, green, whole time, not a single car. I'm the only car. Red light the entire time. And there have been times where I've been approaching a green light, and it'll go yellow to red right before I get to it. No cars around. Like it waited for me to get to that light before it started to turn red so that I would have to sit there and wait. And I don't know if they're just doing this to screw with me. 
I don't know what I did uh, personally, but I do 100% believe that it's just a tactic to make you have to buy more gas. And I that probably sounds nuts to some people, but to people who have been stuck at a red light for 30 minutes without a single car in sight, you know exactly what the fuck I'm talking about. So that's a, that's a big one. I don't really know if there's like that many. I mean, obviously like the satanic panic stuff. I think there's probably a little bit more to that than just like people making up, you know. I think there's probably something to it. I mean, there's obviously, I mean, Jesus, dig into like the, the family and all that shit. Uh, probably save that for another episode. Because, boy, I don't really need this to turn into some, you know whack job shit but it's fascinating to me um so anyways see if i got another question so what was that one the conspiracy one okay here's one if all animals were the same size which one would win in a fight i guess by that they mean which one would be like the most dangerous if all animals were the same size which one would be the most dangerous holy fuck now that is good Okay, so for sure in your head, first thing that comes to mind is like tiger. But that's because tigers are normally already big, scary, and ferocious. But, so if a tiger, so you would have to make a tiger, every animal would be the same size as a tiger. I mean, I'll be honest, house cats are pretty strong. You know, what's crazy is that, like, when you watch, like, Planet Earth and shows like that, they'll show, like, a jaguar, and they'll say, like, oh, this jaguar is 250 pounds. And in your head, you're like, oh, damn, that's pretty big. Like, I weigh about 350, so that thing weighs only 100 pounds less than me. I mean, like, an NFL linebacker, for the most part, weighs about 250 pounds. That's a big cat. But you don't really fully understand how strong... Because you like compare it to a human, which is two hundred fifty pound human, pretty you know, like an NFL linebacker, very strong person. But if you think about like, if you've ever tried to give like a house cat a bath, you know, a house cat weighs what eight pounds, ten pounds, it's like ten pounds. A house cat weighs ten pounds. If you try to give a house cat a bath. It is almost physically impossible to hold on to this animal. Like the amount of strength that a 10 pound house cat has. Now, imagine something that's the exact same thing, but weighs 25 times as much. I mean, you would have no chance. I mean, a jaguar is... I mean, basically, like, 25 house cats put together. There's, like, imagine trying to give, like, you had a bathtub. You have to give 25 house cats a bath. I mean, you'd be, you'd be ripped to pieces within seconds. And this is just one, and these, this is all that put into one thing. (laughs) You have no chance. That being said... Say so, so now you make a jack because like an elephant's very strong, but you'd have to shrink an elephant down to the size of a of a tiger. Like if we're going back to the tiger analogy or example, you'd have to shrink an elephant down to a tiger. I feel like I could handle an elephant that was the size of a tiger. I mean, I'm not you know like some kind of like badass or something, but I feel like I could fairly easily hold my own against a. Uh, a tiger sized elephant. I mean, it'd be like, it's basically a calf, like a baby cow at that point. And I could fuck up a calf easily. I could probably fuck up a full grown cow if I'm being quite honest. Not a bull, of course, but like, I don't know. I feel like I just said something real stupid. You know, the feeling whenever you're like, oh, why the fuck would you say that? That's kind of how I feel right now, saying that I could take out, that I could handle myself against a full grown cow. There's not a chance in hell I could do that. But it wouldn't be a full-grown cow. It'd be a calf. Calf, a lot smaller. Elephant, the size of a calf. Small elephant. 
could probably handle myself. I mean, a full-grown tiger, not a chance. You're shrinking a bear down to the size of a tiger. I mean, either way, you're fucked. But then, like, so if you take smaller, so taking bigger animals and shrinking them down makes them less terrifying. Rhino, I mean, a, a rhino the size of a tiger would be pretty fucking tough, too, but... But it's not necessarily you finding it. It's which one would just like outlast all the others. So I don't know why I'm using myself in this example. But like a tiger, a regular sized tiger versus an, a tiger sized elephant, tiger's winning 100% of the time. Bear, tiger would win. Uh, but you got to take a smaller animal, make it the size of a tiger. Now that's a different story. Like a. Like a. Um, like a scorpion. A scorpion the size of a tiger would be... Oh, boy. <laughs> I mean, it'd be... That might be undefeatable. I mean, you know, scorpions are what about? Yay big? About pecker-sized? I mean, I guess. Like the the black ones. Scorpions, I mean. Um, so... You make that thing 250 pounds. Make it the size of a tiger. Oh my god. It's just no... You'd have no chance. But a spider too. A spider would be about like that. Like a 250 pound tarantula? Like which one is stronger? A scorpion or a tarantula? Scorpion. Gotta be. They're fucking armor plated. And have a giant knife on their <laughs> tail. Scorpion. Scorpion 100%. There's the answer. I'm glad we uh, got through that. It only took about... <laughs> 50 minutes of the dumbest scenario ever. But it was a very good question. Um, and actually, for any of these questions, feel free to like comment your, uh, you know, what you think of my take as a, and, you know, what yours is. If you think there's a, if you think, let's say you make all animals weigh 250 pounds, that's the baseline for every animal on the planet. It, what, if you think there's an animal that could take out a scorpion, what animal? I would be fascinated to know which animal you think could take out a 250-pound scorpion. Um, I mean, an ant. No. I was going to say like a like a fire ant would be. Well, that's a big fucking fire ant. That'd be tough. But a scorpion would fuck up a fire ant, I believe. Yeah. That's got to be it. For sure. All right. Last one. That'll be the last question. And we'll move on from this bullshit. Um, oh, shit. Would you rather have prosthetic arms or prosthetic legs? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, God. Prosthetic arms or prosthetic legs? All right. So, huh. That's interesting. So if you take, so me just being built the way I'm built, poorly would be the you know shortened version. Uh, but my legs, for some reason, most of my weight is in my fucking thighs and my ass. I don't know how it happened, uh, but it happened. <laughs> And, I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot in my stomach, too, a lot under here. There's really just a lot of fat in general. Actually, from the, like, I have, sk I have skinny forearms and hands. That's about, <laughs> that's about the only part of me that's, like, kind of in shape. My neck isn't, well, uh, there's, uh, oh, fuck. Yeah, they're just fat all over. But it's specifically in my, like, thighs and ass. Now, you take away my thigh fat. I mean, there's a, like, I would probably drop damn near 200 pounds. If you took away my legs, I would uh, easily weigh 200 pounds less. The amount of, like, speed and agility that I would have would be incredible. And you can hide prosthetic legs way better than you can hide prosthetic arms. So I think the obvious answer is prosthetic legs. And, like, I mean, 
the amount you use your hands for. Like, really, I don't use my legs a whole lot. <laughs> if that isn't, you know, staggeringly clear. Um, like, I'm not a, I'm not much of a mover. So, having prosthetic legs, I mean, who would, that doesn't really affect. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I think I'm good. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, that was weird. So, again, not much of a mover. Not like a runner. I have been going to the gym, but, you know, I would not have to go nearly as often if, if I didn't have fucking fat-ass legs. So I think taking out my legs wouldn't be so bad. And take out your arms. Like, if I could have, like, big fucking mechanical arms could be pretty nice. I mean, especially if like the hands, you could just make like different tools. If I'm doing that, I'm a hundred percent making my right hand a, uh, having a little add on of a flashlight because I mean, you got no arms. You might as well just fucking lock your ass up and just tug it out for <laughs> You know, hours on end. Now, granted, with bio, uh, you know, prosthetic you know, bionic arms, pretty good chance that those things can malfunction and end up ripping your root right out. Um, so that might not be a good idea. Oh, it's legs. Legs, 100%. I mean, what am I even talking about? Bi fucking bionic arms. No, 100%. Give me prosthetic metal legs. A full Oscar Pistorius. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a fucking role model to have. I mean, hey, if you can, you know, kill your girlfriend and only go to prison for like a couple of years, I guess you're doing pretty good. I mean, OJ didn't go to prison at all for it. So, OJ, still greatest athlete of all time, I guess. Anyways, so there's that. Let's see what's going on in the world. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh my God. Did I talk about, I don't think I talked about this already. I don't think so. No, I didn't. So this little bastard, hold on, this little bastard on the top right, that little fucker beat Tetris. Now, as someone who has dabbled in autism a little bit, I would say I'm probably about 15 to 18% autistic. Um, Tetris is, boy, it's a, that's a game that I get addicted to where I basically have to like, almost have to go to like, <laughs> have like interventions for the amount of Tetris that I used to play. There was something about it that was like so mindless, uh, like, Boy, did it, it just calmed me down. Just watch it, just making little blocks fall. Um, hence the 15 to 80% autism. Now, I fancied myself a pretty decent Tetris player back in the day. I did not know that it was beatable. <laughs> I was for sure never getting that close. Now, I could get like, you know, like I said, I could, get, I could make it pretty far in the old Tetris realm. This little fucker ended up beating the entire game. A game that I don't think anyone knew was beatable. I mean, how many people ever came close to beating this game? And then this little kid does it. Which, I mean, just look at him. The amount of autism just fucking coursing through his veins. <laughs> oh, boy. I mean... That is incredible. I feel like I've talked about this. God, I'm having a weird... Let's just say that I did. Because I'm having a weird fucking case of deja vu. Moving on. Oh, God. Okay. Chinese chess champion stripped of title after defecating in hotel bathtub. Alleged anal beads cheating. Um, Boy, that is a hell of a mad lip. <laughs> Hold on. Let's go through this again. Let's break it down. Chinese chess champion. All right. So a chess champion from China. Stripped of title. All right. Following this. So he did something wrong. After defecating. So he took a shit in a hotel bathtub. 
All right, he pulled an Andre the Giant. Now, this last part, alleged anal beads cheating. Now, um, now despite what I use, despite my normal um, behavior, I actually did read this article because, like most people who were reading along with me just then, I was utterly confused. <laughs> so apparently, this Chinese chess champion. Which, again, if you're a chess champion, there's a pretty good chance that that intelligence... Like, you can't have that much of something without it taking away other things. Life is balance. Um, what is that fucking... Taoism? 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 Tao? Confucius? Hmm. Confucius say... Life is balance. You have a lot of intelligence. You know, normal intelligence, chess champion intelligence, normal behavior, Chinese chess champion behavior. Shrinks down. It's got to balance. Um, apparently, the balance that came from this fella was that him being so intelligent that he became a chess champion also meant that he liked to <laughs> just run wild. <laughs> and apparently was, you know, just dominating chess and then dominating hotel rooms. Basically, he was like the Keith Moon of chess. I mean, just going on full ragers after winning these tournaments and in the midst of a rager, took a big old shit in a bathtub. A.K.A. the uh, the Andre. Uh, now the anal beads cheating thing, a little bit different. So apparently, what this fellow was doing was he had a special set of anal beads shoved right up his keister, and during the matches, had it to where <laughs> they could like give off a. Um, a bit of a buzz whenever he needed to make a certain to make a certain move basically to like cheat his way into making the right moves <laughs> he'd get a little little vibration um right in his uh right in his old bunghole the things people will do to win is just incredible i mean oscar pistorius cut his legs off uh Ilya thomas cut his well, never mind. Um, you know, people will do things to win. People do some wild stuff to win. I, I don't know if I've ever heard of the anal beats thing. That's a, that's a good... I mean, at that point, like, should you really be stripped of your titles? Like, if you're willing to shove a... You know, if you're really... If you're willing to shove a string of beads up your ass to have them vibrate in a certain way for you to know which move to make next, you honestly should be rewarded. Like steroid use should be rewarded. The amount of damage you're doing to yourself so that you can hit a few more home runs, like, yeah, you, sh you should be allowed to do that. Like, you know, it's not risk-free. And I don't know what prolonged anal bead usage does to someone's, you know, outer colon, but it can be great. Hmm. I mean, then again, never really uh, dabbled with them. I mean, I feel like I could hold in a pretty good amount of anal beads if I really had to. Like, I could for sure be a chess champion. I could probably have a set, like, pull a Bobby Fischer and play, like, six people at once. Have six strands of anal beads, one for each uh, <laughs> one for each board. <laughs> Just get a little... <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. God, those things would come out looking like fucking... Muddy coconuts. <laughs> Anyways. Well, I probably need to, let's see, did I, was there another one? I think there might have been one more little thing. Yeah, here it is. A, oh boy, W-A. Is that Washington? It's got to be Washington. What the fuck else state would it be? I mean, it wouldn't be West Virginia, right? West Virginia would be W-V. Washington. My 
God, I'm an idiot. W.A. Washington woman, 62, granted court permission to have dead husband's sperm extracted. <laughs> um, now, immediately, my first thought was, oh, she's making popsicles. <laughs> um, no, she... This article is very confusing to me. Because, one, I mean... How are they getting it out? Like, I know that your body stiffens up after you die. So maybe she's like, hey, um, I mean, this fucker was 70 years old. He ain't been this stiff in a long time. I could actually probably get a little bit out. (laughs) But then also, like, what would she be using it for? Like, she's 62. So if she extracts that man's jism. Like, she's not getting pregnant. I mean, she ended up with a fucking kid who <laughs> probably end up with the damn Tetris kid <laughs> if she was pregnant. Um, I mean, so the only logical conclusion I could come to was that she's using it to make uh, some sort of condiment to package and sell. <laughs> Which I'm pretty sure is what's in the Arby's horsey sauce. So that could be what it is. Um, look, uh, moral of the story. However weird you think you are, you're not that weird. Like as different as you may think you are, as weird as you may think you are, strange, odd, you know, like you think you don't belong, you don't fit in. However high of a level of that you think you, you are, There's always somebody a lot weirder than you. There's always somebody who is willing to perform necrophilia on their dead husband for God knows what reason. There's always somebody who will spend 22 hours a day playing Tetris because otherwise they will be stimming to the point of, uh, you know, running their, their fucking head through a brick wall. There's always somebody willing to shove a bunch of fucking balls up their ass to win chess tournaments. You aren't that weird. Uh, you know, if I could leave you with anything before we move on to the uh, educational part of the show, you're not that weird. You're all right. You're not shoving shit up your ass to win chess tournaments, and you're not getting, you're not jerking off a dead dude. Could be, but you're not. So, there's hope for you yet. All right, time to move on uh, to the, like I said, educational part of the show. Got a few interesting stories to tell, and then we will wrap it up and be done. All right, Uh, so take a little break, and we'll come back and do that. All right, time for a little bit of the old where that come from. Take a uh, word or phrase that people know very well. Figure out where the hell did that come from. So, start this one off. We're going back a couple hundred years to England. Um, now, a couple hundred years ago in England, very common for people who wanted to eat a little meat, got to slaughter your own animals. So, I have to do that with cows, sheep, and pigs. Now, whenever they would slaughter the pigs, how they would do that is they would tie them up by their feet, pull them up by this little uh, pulley system, and lift them up in the air upside down and just start stabbing the shit out of them. (laughs) Oh, boy. Um, So when they would do that, they'd just start stabbing these goddamn pigs, and that would end up killing them. That's how they'd slaughter the pigs. Well, when they were upside down stabbing the pigs... Pigs, obviously, still alive. They start losing their fucking minds, as anyone would. Um, So while these pigs are upside down, being slaughtered, they just start wriggling all around, um, kicking at shit. Well, the little pulley system that they would use kind of looked like the same pulley system that you would use to get water out of a well. Now, the French word for that was bouquet, which 
gets anglicized, English bucket. And so they would call that little pulley system a bucket because it looked like that same pulley system. Well, when the pig is going fucking nuts and starts kicking at it, they would say that that pig is kicking the bucket. And from then on, that is why whenever someone is dead, we say that they kicked the bucket. Yeah, there's that. (laughs) All right, time to move on to a little bit of the old half-ass history. All right, so for the first... uh, little half-ass history story for the day. I'm going to go back to the 1930s in Dallas, Texas. So 1930s Dallas, Texas, there's a postal worker named Ted Hinton. And Ted Hinton used to go into this diner nearly every day. And while he's a uh, patron of this diner, he develops a bit of a friendship with one of the waitresses. Uh, even has a bit of a crush on her. And he would come in every day, eat his meal, and kind of flirt and talk with this waitress. Well, one day, goes back into the diner, She's not there. He's asking around, what happened to her? Um, what happened to the waitress? Uh, like, does anybody know where she went? They don't know. It's like, ah, oh, she stopped coming to work. You know, who knows? So he thinks, well, never going to see her again. He kind of moves on with his life. Um, a little bit later, he is asked by the local authorities to help with the capture of the bank robbers, Bonnie and Clyde. So Bonnie and Clyde have become massively notorious bank robbers in the U.S., and he is asked to help catch them. Now, the reason he's asked to help catch them is because he actually grew up with Clyde Barrow, so knows them decently well, uh, could easily recognize them. Well, now fast forward about two or three years. On May 23rd, 1934, Ted Hinton, as well as the other officers, uh, as well as the other officers who were you know, tasked with capturing Bonnie and Clyde, are in Gibsland, Louisiana. They are able to ambush the vehicle being driven by Bonnie and Clyde. They end up shooting 112 rounds of bullets into the car. So yeah, they're dead as shit. Well, Ted Hinton goes to the car because they need him to help identify, make sure that, hey, that that's Clyde Barrow. Well, he looks into the car, sees Clyde Barrow dead. It's like, yep, that's him. Well, he also looks over and sees a woman next to Clyde Barrow and says, hmm, that woman looks a little familiar. That woman was Bonnie Parker. Bonnie Parker is also that same woman who was the waitress at the cafe that Ted Hinton used to go into every day. So that's where she had been the whole time. Robin Banks with uh, Clyde Barrow. (laughs) Yeah, pretty crazy coincidence. Um, All right, so time to move on to the next one. All right, so next one. uh, A story about one of the most important families in the old uh, whiskey business. So obviously it's going to be a uh, family or the name you're going to be well aware of. so, story about uh, the Jameson Whiskey Corporation. So, everybody knows Jameson Whiskey. Um, Jameson was invented by John Jameson in 1780. Uh, side note, John Jameson is also the great-grandfather of Guglielmo Marconi, the guy who invented the radio. Now, this is not about Marconi, but interesting little side fact. This is actually about uh, John Jameson's grandson, James Jameson, who was a real piece of shit. So, (laughs) James Jameson was part of Henry Morton Stanley's expedition to the Congo River in Africa in uh, 1887. So, 1887, James Jameson joins Henry Morton Stanley on his expedition to the Congo. Uh, They are deep into the uh, African continent have explored all these different parts of Africa along the Congo River. Well, they end up uh, meeting this tribe. And James Jameson and some of the other guys are, uh, you know, kind of talking with members of the uh, tribe, specifically the tribal chief, and kind of 
trying to figure out like what their life is like. No harm, no foul so far. <laughs> Just being a little inquisitive. That's all right. That's all they're doing so far. Just asking them what their daily life is like. Well, James Jameson has heard rumors of certain people in Africa committing acts of cannibalism. These are only rumors. Uh, but James Jameson is kind of curious about it. So he starts asking the tribal chief about cannibalism. Like, do you guys do it? And he, as a joke, according to James Jameson, so actually back up a little bit, uh, while they're on this, so by the way, while they're on this expedition, James Jameson has brought this like sketch pad with him and has been sketching most of the things that he's seeing. Um, uh, he was a bit of an artist and would just sketch, you know, different animals that he saw, different people he saw as a way to kind of, you know, document for himself the things he saw in the African continent. Okay. <laughs> so James Jameson is having a conversation with this tribal chief. Topic of cannibalism gets brought up. And James Jameson, according to him, as a joke, offers the chief six white handkerchiefs for them to eat someone so that he can sketch it. And James Jameson says that that was just a joke, that he didn't think they were going to actually do it. So he kind of is, you know, back to talking about whatever. Suddenly, a group of people come in to where they're sitting with a 10-year-old girl. James Jameson watches as they stab this 10-year-old girl to death and immediately start cutting her to pieces and eating her. Yeah, James Jameson. So you might be thinking, well, how did James Jameson react to this? He sat there and sketched the entire thing. <laughs> James Jameson, the heir of the Jameson whiskey, uh, you know, the heir of Jameson whiskey was a massive scumbag literally watched a child be murdered and eaten so that he could sketch it. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so yeah, next time you're drinking a Jameson and fucking ginger ale. Well, think about that. All right. So last one. <laughs> All right. So this last one is a bit of a doozy, but, it's an interesting one nonetheless. So it involves a woman named Georgia Tan. So Georgia Tan was a social worker for the Tennessee uh, Children's Home Society. And starting in the mid-1920s, she was in charge of adoptions. Now, at the time, Tennessee charged basically nothing for an adoption in a way to try to stop trafficking because there'd be no monetary incentive uh for the adoption. Well, Georgia Tan started realizing that she could make a lot of money by doing out of state adoptions and started selling children out of state for thousands of dollars a child, mostly to the states of uh, California, New York, but really all over the country. Um, most of these kids were being sent to, I mean, horrible homes. So, actually, back up, the way she would get the kids is she would go find like a poor single mom and basically try to swindle that mom into giving her custody of the kid so that she could then sell that kid. If that didn't work, she would then basically outright kidnap the kid. And yeah, she did that for quite some time. Now, most of these kids were end, ended up being sent to live in like horrible situations. Um, a lot of the kids were sent to very abusive families. A lot of them were sent to be child labor. I mean, it was a horrible situation for these kids. Um, so Georgia Tan ends up doing this for 25 years and is eventually caught in 1950. Well, in that same year, before she's ever able to get punished, Georgia Tan dies from cancer. So nothing really ever happened to her. Um, in that 25 years, she was responsible for kidnapping 5,000 children. Yeah. Now, one of those kids 
was adopted by a young couple named Kathleen and Richard Flyer. That child would grow up to become Rick Flair. <laughs> yeah, crazy. So, boy, that's a that is a wild one. All right, so that'll do it for this week. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Um, until next week, uh, 